Control and Prevention in Atlanta, United States. So he's going to talk about blood and viruses. Great, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the, uh, the organizers for the opportunity to talk to you this morning. Um, I'm gonna talk about flaviviruses, and this is a family that contains a number of members that uh, lead to significant uh, <coughs> peripheral and central nervous system dysfunction. Um, before I launch into that, I uh, just thought I'd d define a couple of terms that I'm going to use consistently through this talk. And I apologize in advance if this is a bit simplistic for some, but meningitis basically refers to inflammation of the cover covering of the brain, the meninges, uh, which covers the brain and the spinal cord. People with meningitis typically present with um, fever, headache, neck, nuchal rigidity, or neck stiffness. Now, encephalitis refers to inflammation of the brain parenchyma itself, and people with encephalitis uh, generally present with altered mental status, focal neurologic signs, seizures, and in some cases, both the meninges and the brain parenchyma can become involved, and that's referred to as meningoencephalitis. Now, myelitis is an inflammation of the spinal cord, basically resulting in acute flaccid limb weakness. Uh, you can kind of conceptualize it as an encephalitis of the spinal cord. So these are uh, kind of a list of the sort of the neurotropic members of the flaviovirus family. Um, and you can see um, some uh, viruses that are fairly well known, I'm sure, to this group, Japanese encephalitis virus, West Nile, and Kunjin, which is a, a rela related uh, virus to West Nile, <coughs> dengue, Zika virus, St. Louis, Murray Valley, tick-borne. Uh, I should have put Powassan up here as well. I don't, I'm not sure why I didn't, but... Um, so in this talk, we're gonna talk predominantly about Japanese encephalitis and West Nile, dengue, Zika virus, and then if I have some time at the end, I'll talk about uh, tick-borne encephalitis virus. So I'm gonna start off by talking about Japanese encephalitis virus and West Nile virus, and you might be wondering why I'm kind of putting them into the same, the same boat. Um, it's because clinically they have a lot of similarities, um, so I think I can talk about them um, kind of concomitantly. So first off with Japanese encephalitis, now you already heard a, a very nice talk on this virus yesterday, um, so I'm not gonna belabor this side, but to just say that it is the leading cause of viral encephalitis in Asia, leading to anywhere between 50 and 70,000 cases reported annually to the World Health Organization, and this is by all intents a, an underestimate. It's primarily a disease of children with a case fatality of uh, approximately 20 to 30%, and another 30 to 50% of survivors will go on to have significant neurologic sequelae, often lifelong. And this is just the geographic distribution of uh, Japanese encephalitis. Um, you can see involvement of the Northeast and Southeast Asia and the Indian subcontinent. So when we talk about West Nile virus, um, this is actually a fairly old virus, uh, isolated in 1937 in West Nile, Uganda. Now historically, it's basically been associated with infrequent outbreaks of mild dengue-like illness with rare central nervous system involvement. Historically, it's had a wide distribution between, uh, excuse me, throughout Asia, Eastern Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. Um, now, in 1996, there was a large outbreak of West Nile virus in Romania uh, that was associated with um, significant central nervous system involvement, including encephalitis, meningitis, and anterior myelitis. But really, the, the, the outbreak that kind of exemplified the change in uh, epidemiology of West Nile was its unexpected arrival to the United States in 1999. I'd like to just kind of demonstrate this in a series of maps. So in 1999, uh, the virus unexpectedly showed up in uh, uh, New York City, causing 62 cases of severe encephalitis. Um, and initially, it was, it was chalked up to being St. Louis encephalitis. This is because the serologic cross-reactivity between the two viruses. But in retrospect, there should, there should have been some circumstantial evidence to suggest uh, a different virus, and this included large bird die-offs occurring at the same time as the encephalitic cases. So in the following year, 2000, actually fewer human cases, 21, but you can see a, um, this is pointer, this is uh, a, a greater geographic distribution of the virus. And just to orient you, the air areas in blue represent uh, animal activity, predominantly mosquito and bird, and the red areas represent human activity. So in 2001, essentially two foci to the epidemic, one in the northeast and the second one in the southeast, reflective of bird migratory patterns. But then in 2002, boom, 
uh, you know, you can basically see the, the dramatic um, uh, arrival of, of West Nile into this brand new environment. And at that point, it, it was the largest uh, encephalitis outbreak in the Western Hemisphere, and it was the largest outbreak of West Nile virus um, ever, with over 300, excuse me, 3,000 cases and over 280 deaths. Um, now, since that time, uh, the virus has continued to uh, cause periodic large outbreaks and also endemic illness in the United States. Um, it doesn't appear in the news uh, like it used to, but uh, it certainly is a substantial cause of morbidity and mortality every, every year. And this is where we stood at the end of the, the most recent year where we have complete data, and I think you can appreciate basically involvement of almost every uh, contiguous U.S. state. So it continues to be a, a, a significant pathogen in the United States and to a lesser extent in Canada. This is just to show you that there is West Nile virus in Europe. This is kind of a dated map from 1999, but uh, it has continued to cause uh, sporadic cases of uh, human and animal uh, disease, predominantly in the temperate uh, Mediterranean regions of, of Europe. So you've actually seen a permutation of, of this uh, a couple times during this talk, but um, this is just to demonstrate the JE West Nile human iceberg. And what this represents is the vast majority of infections, approximately 80% are asymptomatic. However, even clinically silent illness is thought to result in lifelong immunity. Approximately 20 to 30% of people develop West Nile or JE fever, characterized by fever, headache, rash, uh, fatigue. And really, it's only the tip of this iceberg, less than 1% of cases, that will go on to develop uh, nervous system disease, referred to as neuroinvasive disease. And this includes the manifestations of meningitis, encephalitis, and anterior myelitis. So if we go a little bit more specifically into the signs and symptoms of JE and West Nile virus, more mild illness is characterized by fever, headache, uh, vomiting. And it's likely that mild febrile illness or uncomplicated meningitis is under uh, underestimated in JE endemic areas and likely underreported in West Nile endemic areas. More severe disease is characterized by altered mental status, uh, movement disorders in about a quarter of uh, patients, and we'll go into that in more detail, uh, focal neurologic deficits such as cranial nerve palsies. Now, generalized weakness is seen very frequently uh, just based upon the fatigue, but the anterior myelitis that results in focal limb weakness is actually much more common with West Nile virus than it is with Japanese encephalitis virus, although it can, could occur both. Um, on the other hand, seizures tend to be much more common with Japanese encephalitis virus. So I mentioned this association between these viruses and movement disorders, and there, there are several different movement disorders that sort of characterize these infections. Uh, now, tremor is sometimes associated with other viral infections, but it seems to be very prominent in West Nile and Japanese encephalitis. Now, it tends to be a coarse tremor. It tends to be postural, and in other words, when somebody's trying to hold a position, or kinetic when somebody's uh, uh, moving. Now, myoclonus is characterized by quick, uncontrolled muscle jerking or twitching. And um, in Japanese encephalitis and West Nile, it tends to occur in the upper extremities, also in the facial muscles. Now, it's a pretty benign condition, really, but it tends to be very bothersome to, to patients who develop it. Now, Parkinsonism is characterized by so-called cogwheel rigidity, bradykinesia or slowness of movement, postural instability, basically the signs and symptoms that you see with Parkinson's disease. Uh, and this is one of the manifestations that most, that's most functionally impairing in these, in these patients. And what we found is that there is a definite neuroanatomical substrate for the development of movement disorders in uh, these patients. And this is just a fluid attenuated inversion recovery MRI in a uh, patient with severe West Nile virus tremor and Parkinsonism. And I think you can appreciate the signal abnormality here in the uh, substantia nigra. These are the dopaminergic secreting neurons of the brain, as well as the posterior, posterior thalami. And these are two regions of the brain that are heavily involved with the control of movement. Now, I men also mentioned this sort of this anterior myelitis, and this is basically due to involvement of the lower motor neurons or the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord, resulting in acute asymmetric paralysis, generally in the absence of sensory loss. And this is basically identical to the condition that's seen with poliovirus. Now, fortunately, it's a relatively infrequent manifestation. Uh, approximately 12% of cases with West Nile neuroinvasive disease are estimated to have this manifestation. 
uh, somewhat less frequent, as I mentioned, in, in JE. So I'm going to switch gears now and talk a little bit about dengue uh, and the sort of the, 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 ca the case for dengue encephalitis. And this has actually been kind of an issue of contention for several years. Um, and there's really s evidence both for and against uh, the case for, for dengue encephalitis. Now, on the one hand, dengue is a flave virus uh, very closely related to several other neurotropic viruses, namely West Nile and Japanese encephalitis. But while JE and West Nile virus have been associated with hundreds of thousands of cases of neurotropic disease worldwide, dengue has really been relegated to very few case reports or small case series. And this is despite its tremendous worldwide illness burden. Um, in addition, many reports of encephalitis have been unaccompanied by signs of CNS inflammation, such as an elevation of CSF uh, white cells or protein or evidence of CNS viral invasion by the detection of viral RNA or IgM-specific antibodies. And then finally, neurologic signs associated with dengue may simply be temporarily related, but not, not necessarily causally, uh, and this is some, sometimes difficult to substantiate. Now, in addition, there are some challenges to uh, the actual diagnosis of dengue encephalitis. Uh, now, a lumbar puncture, which is the way that we uh, obtain cerebrospinal fluid, is generally contraindicated in persons with hemorrhagic illness. So sometimes the lumbar puncture just can't be done. Um, in addition, the vascular changes associated with dengue make it difficult to differentiate true viral invasion or intrathecal IgM synthesis uh, from passive transfer across a, a compromised blood-brain barrier. And in other words, uh, sometimes it can be difficult to tell the difference between intrathecal viral presence or intrathecal uh, IgM synthesis versus a peripheral inoculation from across a leaky blood-brain barrier. And this is a, presents a challenge in making the diagnosis of dengue encephalitis. Um, finally, advanced neurodiagnostics, including LP, neuroimaging, and electroencephalography are sometimes unavailable in dengue endemic areas. So I think it's probably safe to say that in rare cases, uh, dengue can lead to neurotropic disease or neuroinvasive disease, but given this tremendous burden worldwide, it seems to be a, a relatively uncommon manifestation for this particular flavivirus. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the Zika virus. This is, of course, the, the new, new virus on the block. Um, and again, this is, a, this is another old virus uh, being identified in the 1950s. The first sizable outbreak occurred in uh, Yap, the islands of Yap in 2007, where it caused over 100 uh, cases of human illness. Interestingly, no neurologic manifestations were noted. Now, in 2013, there was another large outbreak of Zika in French Polynesia um, with uh, several hundred cases. And in that outbreak, there were 42 cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome that were reported. Um, now you've, and this was in a population of 280,000. Now, you've already heard a little bit about Guillain-Barre syndrome. This is a relatively uncommon autoimmune condition uh, caused by a response to an antecedent antigenic stimulus, which then forms autoantibodies that cross-react with peripheral nerve epitopes, leading to acute bilateral ascending weakness. Um, now, the notable thing about Zika and uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome is the fact that uh, it's, it appears to ca cause uh, a great excess of cases than would be expected. The general uh, calculated incidence of the embracing was about 1.2 cases per 100,000 persons per year. Um, this, no, this number of cases in uh, French Polynesia in this population is about 10 times the incidence that would be expected. Um, in addition, uh, many of the cases ended up testing positive for Zika by PCR and macrolyza. Now, in 2015, uh, of course, we had the emergence of Zika virus in Brazil. And again, we saw the same thing, a, a tremendously high incidence of Guillain-Barre syndrome in areas where uh, Zika virus was epidemic. Now, I should m also mention that uh, in 2015 in Brazil, it was recognized that Zika appeared to be able to cause congenital abnormalities in infants born to mothers who were infected with Zika virus during their pregnancy. Um, so I'm not really going to talk much more about the congenital Zika syndrome, but just to recognize that it's going to represent a significant public health problem for decades to come. So, and this is just an epidemiologic curve from one of the uh, investigations that we did, uh, case control investigations that we did in Salvador, Brazil. 
And just to orient you, this uh, is the estimated incidence of suspected Zika juxtaposed on the incidence of Guillain-Barre syndrome. And I think you can see is that the number of Zika cases goes up, the um, incidence of Guillain-Barre syndrome goes up as the incidence comes down, so does the incidence of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, and this sort of this interval of uh, two to three weeks is consistent with an antigenic uh, stimulus causing this autoimmune condition. So all of these, the, the sort of the, the, the burden of epidemiologic evidence suggests a causal association between Zika and Guillain-Barre syndrome here. So as of November of this year, there have been at least 12 Central and South American and Caribbean countries uh, reporting possible increases of Guillain-Barre syndrome following the introduction of uh, Zika virus. And um, in these cases, it's been uh, noted to have extremely and unusually high incidence of Guillain-Barre syndrome in these areas. Um, some of the investigations that we've done calculate an incidence of 7.6 cases in Salvador, Brazil, uh, 5.8 cases per 100,000 population in Barranquilla, Colombia, and 6.8 cases in, in Puerto Rico. So uh, it seems to be a consistent finding. Now, there have been other reports of other neuro neurologic manifestations associated with Zika, including meningitis, encephalitis, anterior myelitis, optic neuritis, and others. However, again, these have basically been relegated to case reports or small case series. Um, certainly nothing of the magnitude that we've seen with Guillain-Barre syndrome and congenital Zika syndrome. But it seems like in cer certain uh, rare cases that Zika can be associated with other neuro neuro neurotropic uh, illness. So I'm going to finish off really quick just by touching on tick-borne encephalitis virus. Now, this is a virus vectored by ICSIDES ticks. Um, rarely you can get transmission from consumption of unpasteurized dairy products from infected uh, sheep and uh, cattle and goats. Um, the geographic distribution is basically throughout temperate areas of Europe and Asia. Now, there are two important genotypes, the European and the Far Eastern uh, genotype. With both of these, uh, again, the vast majority of infections are asymptomatic, approximately two-thirds of infections. Now, clinical illness depends on the particular genotype. Uh, with the European genotype, 20 to 30 percent of patients will actually have a biphasic course. Uh, the acute illness is characterized by mild fever, headache, um, fatigue, and then there's an approximately one-week asymptomatic period followed by more severe illness, meningitis, encephalitis, flaccid paralysis. Um, mortality tends to be modest, approximately one to two percent and approximately 10% of people will go on to develop significant neurologic sequelae. Now, the Far Eastern genotype is much, a much more severe illness. Um, it's associated with a monophasic illness pattern, um, but tends to present with these severe neurologic manifestations, encephalitis, meningitis, anterior myelitis. Mortality tends to be much higher, approximately 20%. Uh, and there are higher rates of neurologic sequelae in survivors. Um, there is a vaccine uh, available uh, both in adult and pediatric formulations. Uh, it's available uh, in Europe and Canada, and it's recommended for people who are at great risk for exposure to ticks in uh, endemic areas. So I'll just stop there. I know I went fairly quickly, but I wanted to get through as many of the viruses as I could. So thank you. Thank you.